Okay, and we'll start off again on Chapter 4, General Network Security. Um, this is going to give you a, a very broad overview of types of network threats, and um, at, at, toward the end of the chapter, it actually gives you a little bit about mitigating those uh, threats, or maybe not specifically, but at least on a general level, what you need to be doing. Um, so let's start off with talking about the, the classes of attack. They've got um, three primary classes of attack identified. Um, access attack, where you're attempting to gain access to a network, or a hacker is attempting to gain access to a network that they shouldn't have access to, or maybe not necessarily a network, but a network or network resources. Um, a reconnaissance attack is where you just uh, go in and try to obtain information about a network, uh, usually so that you can use that information to plan a more orchestrated attack uh, at some point in the future. And then the, the third class is uh, denial of service uh, DOS attacks, which um, if you guys, any of you guys from Hot Seat, like I've been, I know Ben is very familiar with DOS attacks and you know having to deal with them on our network, uh, which is where you're just trying to deny access to the network or a particular uh, network service. And then there's um, some more specific types on each of these that we'll, we'll go into. Uh, so on access attacks, uh, the, the primary one is a password at attack, which is an attempt to attain access and enable um, you know, some piece of equipment uh, through a password that you don't have. These attacks can be resisted by you know, keeping passwords secrets, uh, using complex passwords, uh, and then on a higher level, implementing TACAGs or RADIUS to handle authentication. And um, you know, you guys working on the NOC, we've already done a lot of these things. Um, I guess you know, keeping passwords secret, you should never ever be you know, even outside of this, never ever share your passwords with anyone. There's no reason any kind of administrator for, you guys know this, but this is like something you have to explain to your grandma. There's no reason that any IT administrator should ever need your password for anything, banking or otherwise. Like, they they would reset your password if they needed you to get a new password. You should never ever provide your password or keep it in a place that it can easily be located. Uh, don't use, uh, using complex passwords, don't ever use birth dates, um, anniversaries, um, your name, you know, simple things. You want to have a, a complex password, like there's a lot of rules that we have to um, subscribe to whenever we set up our password. It's got to have a capital letter, it's at least one capital letter, it's got to have a number at least, it's got to have a special character, lowercase letter. So you get some combination of that and it, it makes it very difficult for different algorithms and um, pieces of software that hackers would use to try to guess a password. Um, be way, way far on the list and almost impossible to guess. And then implementing TAC hacks or RADIUS to handle authentication would be, um, you know, setting up a centralized, um, a centralized server to basically handle authentications. And that's not helpful. <laughs> uh, and then the, uh, the second type, well, one of the other types is trust exploitation, which is a reliance on trust between the client and server. So if, um, you know, client-server relationships require some level of trust. So if the if a hacker is able to gain access to one of those devices, they can usually use it to compromise the uh, the other one. So, you know, if if a server trusts, you know, a certain IP from a client or allows a client to access via a certain IP and protocol and the hacker has uh, access to that client, he would be able to access that server on that same IP and protocol and vice versa. If uh, you know, you know, that, that would be pretty much the worst thing if they, he got a hold of the server itself and would have access to all the clients that, that came in to try to authenticate or do whatever they were doing on that server. Um, and then port redirection uh, it uses a machine with access to the internal network to forward traffic to a port that isn't filtered by the firewall. Um, I use this myself to uh, circumvent the... Uh, oh, go back. Uh, if any of you guys have used a... Um, a proxy server uh, to get around the the firewall the, to prevent you from accessing other websites. Uh, you can basically just set your set up a proxy server and and go to a, a separate port so that you don't have to worry about whatever kind of um, you know firewall they have in place. And port redirection is a perfect example of that. You can use it for a lot of other stuff, but um, yeah, that that basically sums it up. Going if they block port eighty, you know, set it up so that you can look at it on a, a port other than eighty that is not blocked by the the uh, firewall. And then the, the man in the middle, 
is a is basically a hacker sitting in between so he can eavesdrop on on traffic and subsequently use the information gathered to position between the two communicating devices. Once he's done that, he can uh, interpret data, steal information, capture credentials, and uh, even initiate a, a DOS or DDoS. And then uh, reconnaissance attacks. Uh, once again, the reconnaissance attacks, you're just trying to gain as much information as you can about the network so that you can, you can come back in later and orchestrate a more um, you know, suave attack than just like looking at this stuff. So a, a packet sniffer, um, basically, if, you're, if he's able to do that, will analyze packets as they traverse the network. Um, it's usually a software program, but it can be hardware-based um, with software running on that to capture traffic, decode, and analyze. Um, Wireshark is one that I like to use on my own uh, home network. Uh, it's actually, uh, I guess it can be a, a hacker tool, but it's actually a pretty good networking troubleshooting tool um, for, for more complex issues. Like you can actually see the individual packets as they come across, um, you know, what they pertain to, what port they're going to, what port they're coming from, what IP they're going to, what IP they're coming from, and break it down, you know, your network traffic on a really, really granular level. Um, packet sniffers are one of the primary reasons I would recommend using SSH whenever possible over Telnet. Um, I think I mentioned this in the last class, but whenever you, you get a connection to a, you know, a router or a server or whatever and you're just using Telnet, anything that you type across or you know, enter in that goes through that Telnet section is in plain text. So if you were to you know, try to change the password and type in the new password, Anyone who is, who is able to capture that packet with a packet sniffer will be able to see exactly which password you were putting in there. Whereas if you were using SSH, all the data is going to be encrypted, so even if they were able to capture the packet with a packet sniffer, they're not really going to be able to derive much because SSH has a very strong uh, encryption protocol. And then um, additionally on um, reconnaissance attacks, ping sweeps is basically where They'll, they'll have a device send uh, pings to lots of different IP addresses, just see which ones are open, at least on ICMP, and then that, that'll give them an idea, you know, if, if ICMP has not been turned off on a server or router, getting a, a positive response back on a ping sweep will at least tell them, hey, there's some kind of device there, I can probably um, plan some additional attack on that later because I'm not wasting my time on an IP that's not responding on ICMP, at least there might not be anything there. Uh, if I'm getting a ping response, I know there's at least some kind of device attached on that node. And then hand-in-hand uh, -hand with ping sweeps go port scans. So basically once a, once a hacker had an IP that, you know, after doing a, a ping sweep, has an IP that he knows responds to, um, you know, ICMP at least, he could do a port scan on that IP to determine which ports are open. Uh, again, you could do this on an IP that didn't respond to ICMP because some routers or servers might have ICMP turned off, but it's less likely that um, you know a hacker or someone else is going to waste their time trying to orchestrate an attack if they don't get a response on ICMP initially, unless they know it's a specific IP that should have something attached. Um, but yeah, it, all it does is surveys that IP to determine which ports are open. Um, and then since certain ports correspond to specific applications, the hacker can then proceed with more complex attacks. So, you know, if you guys um, pull up the Wikipedia page for uh, known port numbers or commonly used port numbers, you'll have a whole, whole list of the 65,000 some odd port numbers that are allocated for specific tasks. So like, you know, 23 is Telnet, 80 and 443 are HTTP and HTTPS. Uh, respectively, you know, once they get a, a port scan back with all of those ports, they can, you know, basically go through and handpick which one. Okay, well, this this one responded, so they must be using this service. They must be using this service, and then they can, even without accessing the device, just by seeing what services are available, can make some kind of determination as to what kind of server might be on that end. Um, and then the uh, the last part on reconnaissance attacks is information queries. Uh, it resolves host names and IP addresses. Uh, you guys and then I could probably use NSLOOKUP to resolve a host name or an IP address, vice versa. And so that's that's basically all that is to see if like once they find an IP that's live, if it corresponds to a, a particular uh, host name or, the, or vice versa.